be here again this morning. It is Tuesday, October the 19th, and we are going to be in John chapter 9 this morning, so you can go ahead and grab a Bible and turn there with me if you want. Just to uh, continue to remember to pray for those that we are uh, lifting up. Uh, Vanessa, I think, has her fourth round of chemo treatment today, so we want to be praying for her and really the after effects of the chemo is what we want to be sure and pray for and continue to remember to pray for Constantine as he is recovering. And um, Gabe and Crystal Gutierrez uh, had a newborn, I think, little boy yesterday, a grandson. And so we want to thank God for that. Uh, the mother went at week 37. And um, so, but the baby's good health. And I think it weighed a little over six pounds. And so we just praise the Lord for that. Franklin, you can correct me on any of that if you want. I know it was on our uh, small group post this morning. And so this morning, um, I, I want to do this, this old hymn with a little twist to it. Many of you know it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound the wretch I string that suddenly got way out of tune and so that kind of disrupted that a little bit but I was thinking uh, this morning as I was reading through chapter 9 the story of the young man who had been born blind and Jesus spits on the ground and makes a mud pie and heals his eyes I love his response to the Pharisees when they were questioning him when they asked him who is this man he said, I don't know who he is. Uh, all I know is I once was blind, but now I see. And I was just thinking, um, <laughs> you know, I can't explain. I, I can theologically from, from the scriptures what happened, what he saved me and when he saved you. 
but the testimony is we, we're, we're not really sure all the workings of God. We know that he does that. We know that he regenerates us. We know that he justifies us. All of those things that he does, that he um, takes a spirit that was dead and gives life to that and we become born again. But really, at the end of the day, is all we know is we were blind, but now we see. God miraculously saved us, and that's the beauty of salvation. And, and I do love delving into the theology of, of salvation and what takes place, but it, it, it's a miracle. And when he transformed us, when he opened our eyes so that we might see his grace and receive his salvation. It's just a tremendous thing. I really, really, our testimony is, man, I don't know what happened. I just know once I was blind, but now I see. He opened my eyes and he saved me. And we're in chapter nine, and it's a long chapter, and there's so many different things that, uh, that were opened up to me this morning as I was reading this passage. But I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you. Um, it begins in verse 1 of chapter 9. As he, that's Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, that's important to note. This young baby was born, and we don't know his age at this point, but he's evidently a man. Uh, he was born blind, uh, born from his mother's womb blind. An accident didn't make him blind. Uh, deterioration of of the eye didn't make him blind, so that he gradually became blind. He was born blind from the moment he took his first breath. And then the question is posed to Jesus, Rabbi, which means teacher, who sinned um, that this man, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. It's interesting that the, the miracle that's recorded that Jesus um, performed most was healing one who had been blind. There are a number of instances that that takes place in the ministry of Jesus. And it, it was predicted, it was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah that the Messiah would give sight to the blind. Now there's a, there's a dual meaning in that prophecy. Number one is that it speaks of spiritual matters and that where man is blind to, to God, he's, he sees, but yet he, he doesn't see. Uh, he also hears, but, but without hearing. And so there's the implication there that while one might see, until God opens their eyes spiritually, they cannot see God. And um, the other meaning of that is, is a literal meaning, that, that Jesus or the Messiah would heal those who were blind. And so this is, this is one of the instances that there is a fulfillment of the prophecy that Isaiah makes in, in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5, and Isaiah chapter 42, verse 7. And here we see when Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy, uh, we see that he's not only doing it literally, that he's healing a blind man, but he's using this as an illustration to show that he also heals the spiritual blindness of man, where he opens our eyes, he opens our heart that we might see. You see, in our, 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 our born state, where we're born depraved, uh, utterly sinful, blind to the things of God, every man, woman, and child, every child, whether the boy or girl, is born with a sin nature. And it takes, it requires that God open our eyes no one comes to the Son unless the Father draws him. We didn't find God. God sought us and found us and opened our eyes so that we might see his salvation through Christ. None of us can make the claim that we had the heart to seek after God. No, God first draws us. God first bears on our heart. Uh, and and draws us so that we might hear the gospel 
and by our volition, our will, respond to the message of the gospel and place our trust in Christ Jesus. And so here we see Jesus doing the same thing. Now, it's interesting, the question that they asked Jesus, uh, Rabbi, who sinned that this man was born blind? Was it uh, his parents that sinned, or was it the son himself that sinned? You see, the Pharisees had a belief and had a teaching that that uh, that sin of the parent or even or the child would cause physical disease, and Jesus refutes that here in this story. The Pharisees had a saying that they said, there is no death without sin and there is no suffering without iniquity. Well, that's just not true. It's not true to biblical teaching. I've heard many say that uh, we've heard false teachers teach and preach that, that you may have an illness or a disease come into your life as a result of sin, and God is punishing you for that sin. Well, nowhere do we find that in Scripture whatsoever. Now, we can introduce disease to our body uh, through natural means, uh, not eating right, all of those other things. And it can be a result of, of, of a sin, take for instance gluttony, uh, a, a result of the sin of gluttony could be diabetes, it could be heart failure, it could be a number of conditions, but that's a natural cause to, uh, to not eating properly. But here they had the belief that if one sinned, then God would punish through a physical disease, and that's just not biblical at all. And so Jesus answers the question, who sinned, his parents or the son? They also had a belief that that a child could sin actually um, in the womb and it caused a physical disease. They had the belief that, that the child's soul could have sinned in another state and that would be introduced and, and cause uh, a physical ailment or disease. Just mark it down. There is no disease that God gives to another as a result of sin. It's just not biblical. And so if anyone has has taught you that, or if you've heard that, uh, or maybe you have that belief yourself, there's no scriptural support for that whatsoever. And Jesus makes it clear that really it was God's purposes for this young man to be blind. And the purpose of that, Jesus begins to state um, that uh, in verse 3, that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, God, uh, in his sovereignty, allowed this so that God might display his works. Uh, and he might use it as a demonstration, number one, to see that Jesus had the power to heal, and number two, to, to illustrate the point of our blindness spiritually, that our eyes need to be opened so that we might see spiritual things. He goes on in verse 4 to say, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This kind of harkens back to what John said in John chapter 1, that in him was light and there is no darkness at all. And so Jesus uses that metaphorical symbol of light, showing that he sheds light on a, on a sin-wrought, darkened world. It goes on to, to record, having said these things, Jesus spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. Uh, then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went there and washed and came back seeing. Now, why Jesus did it this way, I don't know. Uh, why did he make mud? Why did he spit on the ground and make mud? I don't know, but it's the way that Jesus chose to perform this miracle. Verse 8, the neighbors and those who had sent him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he, and others said, no, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. No, I'm the one that was blind. I'm the one that you sent to the pool to beg for alms, for offerings. I, I can see now, I've been healed. And so they said to him, then how were your eyes open? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go uh, to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed 
where I received my sight, they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. And so he's simply stating I, to their answer, how were your eyes open? He said, I, you know, by this man, Jesus, I, I don't know what he did. Here, here's what he told me to do. But all of a sudden my eyes were open and I was healed. That beckons to our experience in salvation. We don't know. All we know is that we heard the gospel, that God sent his son to live a sinless life, and he was crucified on the cross, and our sins were laid on him, and he paid the penalty and price for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. If you repent and place your trust in him, you'll be saved. And we did it one day, and all of a sudden, our life was transformed. I love it. When I look at the miracle of salvation, to me, it is the greatest miracle that could ever take place. We marvel at miracles like Jesus opening the eyes of this blind man, but there is no greater miracle than to watch and see where he saves an individual. And one of us, we may have come from a background where we we really wouldn't consider ourselves a, 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 a deep sinner. You know, we, we didn't do any of the bad things, but, uh, you know, we lived a pretty good life. But once we understand and get to know the depths of our heart and the depravity in our heart, we will wonder in awe at God in that He alone saved us. Give Him praise this morning that He saved you, He saved me from this miracle. And if you've not trusted Christ for your salvation, then you don't understand this miracle that we're talking about. You've never experienced salvation, a life-transforming thing. Can I say it cannot be something that's done by the act of the will? We can't save ourselves. We can't make ourselves better. We can't make ourselves good enough. There is that placing our trust in Christ and believing with our heart that God, Christ went to the cross and he died, that he was buried and raised again on the third day. We place our trust in him. That is the miracle of salvation. So they, verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. You see, they were more concerned that Jesus had broken their Sabbath rules by performing a work on the Sabbath than they were of the miracle that he had performed. You see, Jesus didn't break the Sabbath. Jesus fulfilled all of the law. The Pharisees had added other laws on top of the command to keep the Sabbath and make it holy, and they were man's laws, and they were upset. These Pharisees were upset. How dare he violate our laws? And um, this, uh, so they said he can't be a man from God because he didn't keep the Sabbath law. How can a man who is a sinner do such things? How can a man, if you're accusing him of being a sinner, heal a man that was born blind? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about this since he has opened your eyes? And the blind man said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? And his parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. So they're verifying this is our son and he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Go ask him. He is of age and he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, go ask him. And I want to, I want to wrap up with this. The Pharisees didn't believe that this was a man had born blind, so they get the parents, the parents verify it. And they ask, how, how, did, this, how did your son receive his sight? And because of their fear of the Pharisees, they 
kind of turned on their son or threw their son on, under the bus and said, you know, we don't know. Go ask our son. He's of age. He can answer for himself. Listen to this point. The Pharisees had made additional laws, had made other requirements on top of what God's command had said. And they were the laws of man. And the parents were afraid of the Pharisees because they knew they'd be thrown out of the synagogue um, if they had declared that Jesus had done this miracle. And so their fear of man and their fear of man-made law caused them to throw their son under the bus. You know, if we're not careful, we can do the same thing as well. Th there's a pressure sometimes within the church, within the body of Christ, to conform to certain laws or certain expectations or certain requirements that individuals add to the Word of God. And rather than standing on the Word of God and saying, no, that's not biblical, that's, 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 that's an additional thing, that's an additional weight that you're trying to put on other people. Rather than stand on that, we can shrink back and conform to the laws of man. It's a snare. Don't get caught in it. It's a trap of the enemy. It's a device that is man-made and it has in its roots that we can be good and righteous on our own. It is a lie from the pit of hell. Don't fall to it. Don't get caught up in the snare. Trust God in his word and stand up to those who would try to add to God's word and place heap uh, burdens on others that God never intended for us to carry. Well, I love you. I pray that God would bless you today, that he give you an opportunity to uh, plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart or cultivate a seed that's already been planted there. Or if by God's grace, he would allow us to watch him save somebody. What a great thing that would be. I pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you. I look forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow morning. Have a great day.